Okay, you have had already two very serious lectures in mathematics and physics. Uh, this one is different. It's a, it's a travel in a number of things which have interested me. And uh, the main point of this talk is to propose uh, an hypothesis, which some biologists have proposed, that essentially maybe the origin of life started deep inside, in the ocean. And uh, what is the unity of my talk today is to try to convince you of the relevance of temperature gradient. The relevance of the fact that if you have a Carnot cycle, this is the simplest, easiest source of energy. And uh, I will travel from geophysics uh, to uh, molecular biology and to bacteria eventually. So, uh, what I want essentially to describe today is that uh, temperature and pressure gradient can be very effective uh, in order to upstart some elementary processes. And uh, I will try to tell you that uh, this temperature gradient uh, are very important and are related to plate tectonics. And then uh, you will see as things go that they come in many different places. So let me start historically. When those two temperatures came, it came uh, from uh, a French scientist, Sadi Carnot, in 1824, who wrote a book on the power of fire. This relates to the first industrial revolution, the heat engine. The heat engine was developed mainly in England, was tried for many, many years, where engineers were trying to improve this, to improve different aspects of friction, different aspects of fluid. And then Carmo came and developed a universal aspect. And by that means, he developed the second law of thermodynamics. So if I translate uh, what he said, you see, everyone knows that heat can produce motion. Agitation of the atmosphere, ascension of cloud, fall of rain, even earthquake, volcanic eruptions as a result of heat. From this immense reservoir, we may draw the moving force necessary for our purpose. But then comes maybe the first time where the idea of universality is put forth while by Carnot. In order to consider in the most general way the principle of the production of motion by heat, it must be considered independently of any mechanism or any particular agent. It is necessary to establish principle applicable not only to steam engine, but to all imaginable heat engine whatever the working substance, whatever the method by which it's operated. And uh, Carnot then shows that there is no point in trying to improve detail here, detail there, what counts, uh, what are the two temperatures. And by that, he introduced the second law of thermodynamics, even before the first law of thermodynamics was introduced. So this is a young man, this is uh, Carnot, who was uh, here a jeune, young student at Ecole Polytechnique, he died very young. And uh, this is his handwriting. And for example, uh, he writes here that heat is nothing else than motion which changes form. To say something like that at that time was revolutionary. And many of the things which appear in this book are revolutionary. And the results are the following. The steam engine is a mechanical device interpreted between two thermal reservoirs. You need two reservoirs, one at high temperature to supply heat the second at low temperature to receive, to receive the discarded heat. And then he has introduced the ideal theoretical machine, a reversible machine, which can be turned from engine to refrigerator. Carnot introduced the refrigerator as the inverse. And he both perfectly in both directions. And then he proves that the efficiency of this engine depends only on the temperature of the two heat reservoir with which it operates. And uh, that was an uh, extraordinary revolutionary idea for the time. And for maybe there are some students, uh, I'll show you what the uh, heat engine goes. This is pressure volume. You have two isotherms. So first you expand the gas. Then you, you continue to expand, but adiabatically by no ch exchange of heat. And then you go to a cooler isotherm. And then you go back 
And the area of the curve is the energy you can recover from this uh, famous Carnot cycle. So two isotherm, two adiabatic condition. But now that I introduce you to Carnot cycle, there is another Carnot cycle. And that other Carnot cycle is continental drift, plate tectonics. The fact that continent moves. And they move because there are temperature gradient between the center of the Earth and the surface. Now we go from 1824 to 1912, where the first model about continental drift came from the German geologist Wegener. He proposed that there were motion of continent, but as he was unable to demonstrate what mechanism for this motion, what he called the Forschibung der Continent, the motion of continent, one has to wait in the 1960s when Dietz, Hess, and Wilson proposed a model for mantle convection current and plate tectonics. So you have two temperatures, the center, the surface, and it leads to, it leads to motion. So <coughs> this is a representation of the Earth, and the continent are lighter, they are more viscous, the crust is denser, can be recycled, so you have from the hot region here to the cold region here a lot of convection. The difference in temperature is about 3,000 degrees, the size are 3,000 kilometers. From that you can define, as you know, in hydrodynamics you find always dimensionless number. There is a number we define, our constraint is this flow, it's a Rayleigh number, which has this number. and. Because it's dimensionless, what is true here is true also if you can do the same experiment with the same Rayleigh number in a fluid like water in the laboratory. And among the proposal, one of the proposal was made by Wilson. And it's called the Wilson cycle that uh, the continent oscillates and the oscillation at the period of 300 million years. 300 million years. But on the last 150 million years, then there is a formation of uh, on this reconstruction on the last 150 million years shows you how all the continents have moved to the position we know now. So for you, if you look at India, India was part of the South Pole, uh, Australia also, Madagascar also. You can see Africa and South America connected. And uh, you will see uh, Italy was part of Africa. So <coughs> now, as uh, it will recycle all the time. So you see India is detaching, crashing, making the Himalaya. Italy is detaching from Africa, crashing on Europe, making the Alps. Australia stops here. And this is this beautiful story of, uh, of another type of, of cycle, a kind of cycle which is this motion of continent. So this is on the last 150 million years, but on 300 million years there was an oscillation, proposed oscillation. So with uh, my postdoc, Jun Zhang, who is now professor uh, at the Courant Institute in New York, we decided that we'll try to do an experiment showing how continent oscillates. And that is my hydrodynamic part. So, what do you do uh, to show those things? You do a flow between two temperatures. You do what is called a Rayleigh Bénard convection experiment, and uh, we do it in water. So this is a view of a cell. The bottom is heated, the top is cooled. Temperature difference is about 10 degrees. <coughs> uh, the size is about 10 centimeters. And what you see is that at this Rayleigh number, you see that the bottom boundary layer detach and you see plumes which are hot fluid going up and you see cold fluid going down. Hot fluid goes up because as you heat, the, you expand the fluid and cold fluid goes down uh, because here it's denser, so it's heavier. And this leads to this cycle of uh, flow with all <coughs> those uh, small excitation. You visualize very simply by projecting a plain, uh, plain uh, optical wave. And because this is hotter, it makes a small lens effect. And what you see is lens effect of hot region and lens effect of cold region here. So this is 
thermal convection in the laboratory on a size like that in water. You see, it's trivial like. Uh, so, in order to study this motion of continent, what we built is a cell, but with an open surface. And this is a floater, and we want to see what happens to the floater when you apply a DC temperature difference, which is about 10 degrees, and then we cool by pumping here, and you have a laminar cooling, and we look at what happens to this plate, and what you will see is that in a simple experiment like that, the plate will oscillate all the time. It's a simple limit cycle. And what creates this limit cycle is the following. You heat from below, you cool from the top, but where the plate is, the heat flux is blocked, which means that this region becomes warmer than the region nearby, where because of uh, the pumping of the, of the gas, you cool here, you cool there. So we create a flow like that, and this flow will induce motion. We visualize uh, this uh, flow motion. The visualization is another trick which uh, one uses in fluid. You put small liquid crystal particle, which uh, colors represent the temperature. So here it's hot, it's blue. Here it's cold, so it's yellow. So those are small uh, micron skies particle, and you can see the flow. And let me show you now how the process goes. Blue is hot. So you see, when the continent is on this side, you cut the heat flux. Well, here you have 3x flux. So this is warmer than this. Being warmer, you have a flow developing like this. And this flow will move the continent. When it arrives here, you start to build up a hot region here. This hot region, you see this blue developing, will induce a flow like that, and the continent will move in the opposite direction. So you see a very simple limit cycle, and this is how those uh, continents were oscillating in Wilson model. I will show you now the experiment in function. You see the continent is here, it's moving here. This is warming up, so slowly a flow builds here. The continent moves like that. And then you warm up this region, and then the continent moves this way. And so this clock was running for a year in the basement of, uh, of Rockefeller University. And just to show to the biologists that limit cycles are trivialities, and they should not be overexcited when they see a limit cycle in some of their cells. Uh, and of course, uh, coming from nonlinear dynamics, uh, uh, you can follow in time this oscillation. If the continent is large compared to the total size of the box, it oscillates fast. And when it's small, it takes a long time to build up and to move. And of course, if you increase the relay number, if you increase the temperature difference, we show all the cascade, period doubling, and all the phenomena of nonlinear dynamics in the motion of continent. So you see two temperature gay back to Carnot-like because Convection is like a Carnot cycle because you have two isotherms, which is a bottom plate hot, the top plate cold, and then you have adiabatic transfer because the fluid moving up goes fast. <coughs> and uh, the big continent does something of that sort. But now I'm staying with uh, plate tectonics, and now I'm going to more biological questions. Uh, this is the view, America, Africa, those are two of the plates. And between plates, you have ridges. And this uh, ridge is a region where the plates are moving out, which means that fluid from the center of the Earth comes up, solidify, and is moved. <laughs> and along those ridges, there are cracks. And at those cracks, seawater penetrates, heats up, and comes back with big jets. Those are called a uh, hydrothermal vent. Now we are moving from the 1960s to 1977, 78, where thermal vents were de detected. And 79, from uh, Foot Hall, a small submarine went and did some measurement. So those vents form in the ocean along the mid ocean ridges. Those are locations where two tectonic plates are diverging. 
a new crust is being formed. Sea water is driven through fault along those, and some water is released by upswelling magma. This water which comes out is at a temperature up to 400 degrees, and the sea water deep down is around 2 degrees. Now, the high pressure expands the thermal range of liquid water. The water does not boil, even at this temperature, because, of course, you are down there, and down there you have uh, not too far from a kilo atmosphere, a kilo bar. <coughs> okay. Minerals are dissolved, and uh, the minerals which are taken from deep, when they come out, they precipitate and make small volcanoes. Those volcanoes are about two meters high, and the uh, vent, uh, are in, in, the water is injected through those volcanoes. The density of organisms around the thermal vent are huge, enormous, maybe the highest you can form. And there is a lot of CH, CH4 and NH3 present, so some biologists suggest that life originates there, which means that life does not come from heaven, but might come from hell. <coughs> <laughs> in that model. So this is a presentation. You see the spreading axis. You see the water coming out. You see here the deposit which makes a small volcano. You see the temperature. This is the sea temperature. A lot of minerals come out uh, outside of the vent. So you have temperature difference. And because you have big injection, you have pressure difference. And once you have temperature gradient and pressure gradient, a lot of things are possible. So this is a view of a vent, and the scale typically is a lot of a meter. And you see this injection of a hot fluid full with minerals. And this is a realistic view of a, a vent in action. And you can see all the flow of a hot region. And around that, there is a low, huge ecosystem and a very original ecosystem. For example, you see this tube is in fact an organism living from the bacteria which are in this vent. This, those organisms exist only near the thermal vent. Now realize uh, you have at high pressure, you have a huge temperature here, but here you have a few degrees. So on those uh, vents, if you look at the material, because it's deposit, you have a, a deposit with a lot of pores, and at those pores, you have all the possible temperature gradient you have. You have 400 degrees altogether, but locally, you can have a lot of different temperature gradient. So I will not uh, detail to you uh, the particularity of the fluid which is injected. Uh, it's high temperature. It has a monovalent ion. It doesn't have magnesium, but it has a lot of calcium. So as you know, divalent ions are necessary. And it has a lot of all the silicon, chloride, and sulfate, and manganese. And there are a lot of bacteria living around those vents, which are anaerobic bacteria, which is they live without oxygen. And they absorb all those material. And they are much smaller than usual bacteria. Typically, their size is half the size of our usual bacteria, E. coli, half a micron, so in volume, they're almost 10 times smaller than the smallest bacteria which we are used to work with. So, large temperature gradient, large pressure gradient, because uh, you can have 300 bars, 300 atmosphere down there because of the depth, but because of injection at the vent, you can have up to kilo atmosphere. You have water and salt, you have rich mineral content, so this is what biologists have proposed, that maybe life could have originated there. So I'm not a biologist, I'm just giving you. And if you want to know more, there is a recent December 2009 Scientific American paper talking about expanding this limit of life. So now come our experiment. Once we realized that those temperature gradients uh, exist, we thought that we can do a number of experiments to study what non-equilibrium thermodynamics can do when you have two temperatures. So I will tell you about DNA in a temperature gradient. This was work done with my postdoc, Dieter Brown, who is now a professor at Munich University. 
And uh, I will show you two things. Temperature gradient allows some physical phenomena. The first one, it allows thermophoresis, which means that in a resting fluid, if you have some DNA and a temperature gradient, if the fluid has rest because of friction to walls, the DNA will move, and DNA will always move from the hot region to the cold region. And because of this process, this uh, thermophoresis process, we can accumulate DNA by a factor of 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, which I will show you. And this answers one question that the people always have at the origin of life. How can you reach a critical concentration of the sensory molecules so that chemical reaction can start? What we show there in this first work is that the uh, temperature gradient will do that for you. Now, after that, I will show you that temperature gradient can do more. They can make amplification of DNA, meaning that this is for the biologists, uh, your, the usual classical PCR machine, which is a machine used in all the lab to amplify DNA, is nothing else than a machine with two temperatures. A hot temperature where DNA is melted, and then a cold temperature where DNA is copied. Well, this is exactly what convection does for you. So we invented the smallest PCR machine around, which is just a piece of money like this, on which we put a laser, infrared laser in the center to reach 90 degrees. Around we had 60 degrees. This was the fastest PCR machine ever, but that was done to show that PCR is a natural phenomena also. So first, thermophoresis of DNA, which is called the Soray effect and lead to a giant increase in concentration. If you take your fluid, your water at rest, DNA will move if you are in a temperature gradient. You will have thermophoresis. It will move from the hot region to the cold region. So what we do, we have a sample. We focus an infrared laser, and we choose a wavelength such that it's strongly absorbed in water so we can reach here temperature up to 90 degrees, even if the round surrounding is at around 10 degrees. We can locally, on <coughs> about 50 micron, increase the temperature. So suppose you have a sample like this one, very thin, 25 micron, so that when you heat this region, your water does not flow because of friction to the wall. But DNA moves away, and if you have here, if you increase the temperature of the surrounding here by 2 degrees, DNA gets out from that region. So if you take fluorescent DNA, you drill a kind of hole, and you see there is less fluorescent DNA leaves. Gets always out of a hot region. Why is he getting out? Uh, uh, I would say that uh, very quickly, physically, uh, DNA is one of the highly charged polymers. This charged polymer has to be screened. It's screened by ions, monovalent ions. Monovalent ions screen on the, on the uh, on the Debye length, the length which is uh, a length, so it is a ratio between a velocity and frequency. The velocity is the thermal velocity, and the frequency is the plasma frequency of the ions, which means the length goes as square root of the temperature. And if you go to colder, then the length decreases, so you gain in free energy. So this is a mechanism while DNA gets out. Now, if you make this a little thicker, so convection can start in, then you get in this regime. So you see, now you allow the fluid to move. So you start by heating this region. The first thing you see is DNA is expelled after five seconds. But then slowly you build up convection. Because here it is hot and this is, is cold. So you build up convection, which takes some time. And what happens is that convection and thermophoresis go in the same direction here but in opposite direction here. So slowly, slowly, you accumulate DNA at this region, and the accumulation is huge. And for a thicker sample, you see. So you can concentrate DNA. You can concentrate protein just because you have two temperature, just because you have a flow of a temperature gradient. So that is what mechanism which could be used at the level of the vents. Now, what about DNA? Amplification. Now, for that, uh, you should know how P 
PCR machine works. A PCR machine is a chain reaction where essentially what you take is that if you take DNA, you know DNA is double-stranded. And then you, if you add hot, high temperature in the center, uh, 90 degrees, the two strand, uh, the hydrogen bond breaks, and you have two single-stranded. Then because you have convection, you have a flow, so the single-stranded are brought here. Here you are at 60 degrees, so it's copied by the polymerase machine. And then it comes back. So one cycle, you have doubled the number of DNA. So at each cycle of convection, you can double. And this is the way this uh, PCR uh, machine works. And uh, this is uh, the sample, just by symmetry, uh, the flow is in this form. Uh, you heat this region. This region is cooler. And how do we visualize uh, the amplification? Well, this is a trick which is used in biology all the time. You use a fluorophore which intercalates in double-strand DNA. Double-strand DNA is an organized structure, so the fluorophore can intercalate. And when it intercalates, it fluoresces. Single-strand DNA is disordered. There is no organization, so you cannot intercalate. So what you see is that as time goes on, slowly in the cold region, you see more and more of a fluorescence, which means DNA. In the central region, where you are at 90 degrees, you are dark because you have only single stranded. And you get the curve, which for the biologists in the audience are the classical curve of PCR. So, and also you can show how the gain will depend on the temperature, central temperature. So it's an amplifier due to chain reaction. And again, this phenomena is due to the fact that you have two temperature. So in those events, if you use the law of non-equilibrium thermodynamics, the fact that you have a two temperature allows you to accumulate, allows you to amplify. And now uh, those uh, ideas are used uh, by the geologists and geobiologists working at the origin. So, okay. Now I told you about temperature gradient. But I told you also that there are pressure gradients in the place where there are thermal vents. And now I will tell you a little about uh, the physics of water. <coughs> what does water under pressure? Uh, you know that water is an anomalous fluid. You know that ice float. And you know that at four degrees, water is denser than the, than the, the ice. And uh, the reason for that, if we take a very simple model, which was a model introduced by Bridgman and developed by Pauling, is a two-fluid model. That water is made of a simple normal fluid, which is completely disorganized. But another part of water is an organized fluid. And that organized fluid made by a group of about 20 hydrogen bonded molecules, which form pentagonal dodecahedron. This is the associated fluid. It fluctuates all the time, but you have this ordering. Now, when water is cooled, the number of associated molecules increase. You get more and more of this organization. So what happens? When you cool water, like any, any, any condensed uh, phase, you should contract. But the organized fluid keeps increasing, and this organized fluid is at a larger volume. And that will lead to a change of minimum in the volume per gram, which is, this is a typical curve where this is temperature from 10 degrees to minus 20 degrees. And you look at uh, one gram, the volume of one gram of water. What you expect normally is that as you cool, the volume decreases that you compress. But when you are at a pressure, zero pressure, what you find is that, yes, it does. But as you organize fluid, the concentration of it keeps increasing. At some point, it takes over. And you have this four degrees anomaly. Now, the numbers you see here are pressure in atmosphere. As you increase the pressure, you start to compress the hydrogen bond between the water molecule. And when you reach a pressure of about uh, 3,000 atmosphere, you destroy the organized fluid. Which means that at uh, about above 3,000 atmosphere, water becomes a simple fluid. What does that mean? That means that biology disappears. 
Biology is based on the fact that amino acid and DNA, you have hydrophobicity, hydrophil, hydrophobe, and hydrophil and hydrophobe is due to the organized part of water. When you put a carbon chain, you, you increase the size of the organized part. So there is no more organized parts here, which means that uh, there is no more. And that led to what Bridgman, you know, the famous Bridgman, in his book, The Physics of High Pressure, would say, the abnormality of water, so important biological phenomena, are local abnormally confined to a few thousand atmospheres. Life is a particularity on some temperature range and a some small pressure range. Now, why is that interesting? Because the chemical reaction you do at normal pressure implies a lot of enzymatic action. But when you are at high pressure, then you have no more of this uh, biological fluid. And what happens is that some of those reactions become trivial. For example, at 6 kilo atmosphere, it has been shown recently that if you, now I'm talking to a biologist, if you take one of the RNA, transfer RNA, an amino acid, the amino acid will bind to the 5 prime end without ATP, without enzyme, with nothing. So if you start to cycle in pressure, there are many things you can do which uh, you cannot do under the pressure that uh, we live in. And this is what my laboratory is doing now. We keep cycling in temperature and pressure up to 6 kilo atmosphere and try to show that many, we, many reactions are possible. We are trying to show that you can polymerize nucleotide to make uh, a library of DNA. Uh, we can show that you can load DNA and RNA with an amino acid, all that in the, without any, any protein. And as you know, the problem of the origin of life is uh, always a chicken and egg. So uh, protein implies a code. The code implies that you have uh, the DNA. So, so it has to start. And the start is supposed maybe to come from just an RNA. And what we are showing here is that, again, if you use the law of physics and what physics can bring you, there are processes which are possible, which are not possible at pressure, atmospheric pressure. So this is, again, to show that cycling in temperature, cycling in pressure is, is relevant. Okay. I will finish very quickly by telling you that those temperature gradients uh, are there in our thermal vent. And around those thermal vents, there is a huge concentration of bacteria. So bacteria are su submitted to temperature differences. And then we play a game. OK, those are the thermal vent. To look at how bacteria respond to temperature. This is work uh, which uh, was done with another postdoc, Hannah Salman, who is now professor at the University of Pittsburgh. And what I will show you is that in temperature, gradient, bacteria can have extraordinary behavior depending on uh, whether they've been raised at low density or raised at high density, and that they respond in a very remarkable way. So very quickly, I think I have 10, 15 minutes. The bacteria we use is E. coli. E. coli is a bacteria which we all should be familiar with. It's here. And uh, uh, it allows us to digest. It's our friendly bacteria when it does not mutate. Uh, for those who don't know, you should know that we are, in first order, defined as a bag of bacteria, more than a human, because we have more bacteria than human cells in our organism. So here you see typical size of E. coli is a micron. Here you see a picture of a division of E. coli. And you see some of the flagellum. This is a view of E. coli. Uh, e. coli is a good E. coli. Uh, we'll have six flagellum. Of course, there will be a lot of fluctuation in that. Size is about a micron. Flagellum are about 10 micron in length. So this is a very minute uh, object, which move in a remarkable way, responds to temperature gradients, uh, respond, goes to hot temperature, responds to food, and responds to also amino acid. 
In fact, it has uh, extraordinary properties. And uh, because it's one micron, you could ask yourself the question, how does E. coli can see gradient? Gradient of temperature or gradient of concentration of food? Because on one micron, it's very hard and difficult to look at differential measurement. Well, E. coli does it by developing a kind of directed Brownian walk. You see, it has flagellum, and those flagellum can rotate. They rotate clockwise, but they can rotate counterclockwise. And in fact, they switch almost every second from clockwise to counterclockwise. In one direction, when they rotate clockwise, they uh, don't get together so that they create a very complicated motion which leads to some tumbling. But once they rotate counterclockwise, all the flagellum get together and you have a motion. So you will see now here a picture of E. coli motion and you will see this uh, moving and tumbling phenomena. Those are the bacteria moving, moving, now tumbling. Moving and then tumbling, moving and then tumbling. Let me play it again. This is a gorgeous movie done by Berg, Harvard. And you see the complete organize of the sixth uh, flagellum in one direction. In the opposite direction, they tumble. Which means that the bacteria move fast, then tumble, move and tumble. It's like a Brownian walk. And uh, what will happen is that when there is a gradient of food or a gradient of temperature, if uh, it's a positive gradient, which means an attractive one, they will tumble less. So they will have directed motion more. And it is by playing between moving and tumbling that they are attracted. So this is a beautiful phenomenon of a one micron object, how it can sense temperature difference, how it can sense gradient of food or gradient concentration. You see again this uh, marvelous uh, object in action. Okay. Uh, it has to detect, it has sensors. Uh, it has about a few thousand sensors all around its membrane. And the sensors of receptors are sensitive to amino acid, to food, but are also sensitive to gradient of temperature they will tend to move to high temperature. <coughs> so I will not go into detail of uh, how uh, all that is uh, organized. Let me say that one of the receptor TSR is sensitive to a small amino acid, which is glycine, another one to the other smallest amino acid, which is aspartate. And E. coli can absorb, to detect those amino acids, can emit them. And it is through this exchange of amino acid that when E. coli are very close to each other, they talk to each other by emitting and detecting amino acid like glycine. And uh, I will just show you just uh, uh, one thing which we, which we know is that when there is a low level of uh, amino acid, a low level of uh, detection object, the two receptors push E. coli to go to high temperature but when the concentration of the amino acid glycine and aspartate is large, one of the receptors becomes ineffective, and the other one switch from going to high temperature to low temperature. And uh, this process leads to the fact that uh, if you take now our bacteria E. coli, and you grow them. If you take them in a regime of slow, the beginning of growth, where there are very few E. coli, they are very far apart. The emission and detection of glycine and aspartate, as they are far apart, they can detect it, they cannot detect it. So their receptor move always, are sensitive to high temperature. If you keep growing them, you know, uh, the E. coli has a doubling time, about half an hour. So this is a growth curve, this is logarithmic, this is linear in time. If you are now at a very high density of E. coli, they are close to each other, they sense the emission of each E. coli by the other, their receptor is affected, 
and then you will see the difference. Here, we take E. coli, which have grown at a very low concentration. And if we, if we apply here our temperature gradient, which means we heat this small region, what you see, each point here is a fluorescent E. coli. You see that the particles are attracted by the hot region. They tend to accumulate. Those are E. coli which come from a low density colony. If now you go to a high density colony by letting E. coli double a lot, then uh, they are underfed, they see each other, they are in interaction with each other, they talk to each other, and then the same E. coli will have a behavior which is exactly the opposite. It will go to low temperature. You see, they are getting out of the hot region. So the same particle, depending on how they've been raised, and uh, will have a, an effect which is completely different. And this is a collective phenomena acting on all the E. coli. Just to show that, again, temperature gradient will have effect. And what happens here is that when the bacteria have been raised in such a way that they have a very high concentration of them, they will tend always to escape high density. So instead of going to this small high temperature region, they will escape from it. But uh, a complete explanation will take too much time, but this is what uh, is happening. Cell taken from a low density culture and putting at a given concentration accumulate. Cell coming from high density culture tend to repulse. If we label with different colors cell coming from low temperature culture or light temperature culture, you see the red one accumulate, the green one. And this is a collective switch. And this is again a phenomena of temperature gradient acting now on an organism. So I won't enter into all the phenomena which we have discovered, uh, and in particular the fact that this effect can have a very long time memory, a memory which can last on many generations of E. coli. Let me just uh, summarize and conclude, because I think I am the end of my talk. You see, in the first part, I showed one aspect of natural dynamical system, the physics of plate tectonics, with a uh, simulation and laboratory experiment. And you know, this is, as you know, the realm of partial differential equation, initial condition, boundary condition, continuous mathematics. Second part, which I went to biology, I showed that in living system, for example, the bacteria E. coli, even the collective response of one micron cube bacteria, information that animates the dynamics, whether the bacteria talk to each other or don't talk to each other. And those little organisms, they talk to each other, they have a memory, they adapt to the environment. They are like a moving cellular automata. But what unites all those effects is the fact that whether you are in plate tectonics or amplification of DNA, uh, this is an origin of life, temperature gradient are essential, which means that a Carnot cycle gives you a cheap form of energy, and that cheap form of energy can be used in many, many different aspects. It leads to the formation and the motion of our continent. It might be at the origin of life, and uh, the law of physics enter in a very strong way as soon as you have temperature gradient and pressure gradient, there are many things you can do which will be difficult to do otherwise. Okay, this is the end of my story. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Over there. Yes. My question is at what point and uh, what circumstances did uh, handedness or chirality enter into life? The effect of chirality. That's right. You talk about chirality. That's right. Uh, that's, uh, that's a much uh, that's a serious question. It's another type of question. The fact that uh, molecules uh, have a given chirality, so there is a symmetry breaking which has occurred. 
And uh, what the suspicion is always is that if it is started, one chirality will try to take over by being more efficient than the other. This is uh, the only hypothesis we have. But of course, uh, uh, molecular, uh, biological molecule have chirality. Young man, red t-shirt there, then. Yeah. Well, do, do you think that Miller's experiment was irrelevant? What, what, what? Miller's experiment, was yes. it irrelevant, or do you think that it could have, that the mechanism that he had envisaged could take place where you want it? Miller's experiment is another type of experiment. What Miller shows is that if you have discharge in gases, you can produce amino acid. You cannot produce DNA, you cannot produce RNA. It's amino acid. Now, amino acids are ubiquitous. You can produce amino acid by many, many different mechanisms. So, Miller's experiment is correct. You can, by discharge, by produce amino acid. You can produce them in many other ways. The amino acid is a simple molecule. RNA or DNA is a very complex molecule with a base, a sugar, and a phosphate, and it's extremely hard to synthesize. So Miller experiment uh, was an important one to show that amino acids are everywhere. In fact, astrophysicists know that if you try to look at the infrared of the sky, the, 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 the sky, you, you get also amino acid. They are everywhere. It's not the same thing for DNA and RNA. So Miller experiment stops there. Uh, in the PCR, in the PCR uh, machine, yes. When the DNA splits, and then new strands are formed, where do those new strands come from? Are there free nucleotides floating around? No, your question is what's the difference between the high temperature and low temperature? No, once the, once the DNA has split, once the two strands... When it's split, yeah. yes. After that, yes. you said that new strands are formed. Yes. Now, so how they are formed is that when you're at low temperature and you have the two strands, which come from the high temperature, uh, an enzyme, a polymerase, comes and copy each strand. So the two single strands make two double strands. So you start from one double strand, you get two. This is chain reaction because the cycle starts again and again and again. And each time you will double. So this is how DNA is amplified. And this is a machine which is used everywhere. PCR is a banal machine of every biology lab. What we were showing only is that uh, convection does that for you. So in small volume, you can have a PCR machine functioning. So the principle of amplification, the physical principle of amplification, is there as soon as you have a temperature gradient. This is what we just showed, only that. Um, are there more complicated uh, organisms that are anaerobic, apart from bacteria, and, and if there aren't, why aren't there? I mean, if, if this is the origin of life. Well, uh, the only thing we can say is that uh, uh, when you look at the development of life, it took about one billion years to start to create the prokaryote, which means bacteria, a single cell. It took more than one more billion years to create a eukaryote, us, a multicellular organism which are baroque and very complex to make. So it starts with the simplest form. Now, in my lab, we are, creating, we are making artificial cells which look a little like bacteria, uh, and they are easy to make. You take a phospholipid, you put uh, the code, the DNA, you add some of the necessary uh, material, and this uh, vesicle will, will function and produce and express, gene for, uh, express protein for about a week. We are trying now to destabilize this vesicle, following again a DNA program, and show that one vesicle could make two vesicles, following from a man uh, approach to self reproduction. So, E. coli, I would, I would say, or bacteria, has the simplest form. And uh, certainly, they are among the origin. May I ask a question which Sir Jesse Bowles had asked? more than a century ago, where is the boundary line between the living and non-living? Well, uh, good question. Uh, we all, many of us uh, in this room, they work on non-equilibrium processes. Dynamical system, turbulence, hydrodynamic weather condition, 
plate tectonics. This is not life. But it has many of those aspects. You have pattern, you have dynamics of pattern, you have motion. But there's something missing which exists nowhere in astrophysics or in geophysics. There is no code. There is no code to that. Life is a coded system. It's based on a code, a genetic code, which means that every object of life is coded in its DNA. And that is, for me, one of the main differences. Many of the other things we can reproduce just in our physical system, like convection, like whatever you want. But the coded system, that is what is absolutely singular and unique on life. And this is why uh, I'm part of the people who are trying to see whether in our lab we could generate an early code starting from, from a population of RNA or DNA. And this is why uh, I told you that pressure gradient could be essential to make libraries of those from which uh, Darwinian evolution will start to amplify the efficient one, non-efficient one. So for me, the difference is that life is a coded system. And because it's a coded system, you have all the combinatorics of a coded system, so you have all the diversity of life. And as you know, in that diversity, you can exchange genes. It's, it doesn't matter. In our artificial cell, we mix uh, genes from eukaryote, from prokaryote, the regulation, from phage, an artificial vesicle, we put them together, it functions. As long as you have a coded system. So that's, to me, to me personally, is what life is about. It's a non-equilibrium coded system. So my question just follows on that. You said life is a <coughs> coded system. So in one of your uh, last slides, you mentioned the motion resembles cellular automata moving and so on. And the cellular automaton is also a coded system. Would you consider that life? No, I don't. It's not, it's not a coded system. Uh, I'm, I'm saying that uh, in life, the difference between life and other non-equilibrium systems is the fact that life is a coded system. That's the only thing I'm saying. Right at the back. Hello. And then when you organize protein, you start to have the beginning of what could be living system. So that's why it's very important to be able to show that one can link the RNA world to the amino acid world. And that is, is an essential discovery a few years ago in Poland, that at high pressure, if you take an amino acid and you take your RNA, the amino acid binds to the RNA with no enzyme, nothing, absolutely nothing. So. It will take, you know, life is something else. Life needs an organization of the whole thing, but you have to start with how you started by making a coded molecule, and what is it coding? And then once you have the population of RNA and protein, then you can start to, by evolution, to hope to organize something. First, we repeat our round, and uh, you, can, you have to make uh, a cell, so that's easy to make. And then slowly you, you process things. And at some point, beginning of living organism starts. This and there are theories which state that RNA came before DNA. I mean, they were synthesized. Well, you know, the good thing is that uh, the work I'm describing to you is a work done by an old scientist like me, so I can afford to do philosophy because we'll never know. <laughs> so who cares? But uh, for me, what I would like to show is uh, demonstration of principle. That the principle that we could start some elementary coded, coded uh, molecule. If we can show that, I think we have de we demonstrate that there is no magic, there is no mystery. Now, how is it done? How it did? Was it done? We have no way to know. Thank you. Hello. Thanks for the very good, excellent talk. I would like to ask, uh, in the talk, you uh, were saying that uh, uh, some, with some pressure and temperature, you, one can achieve some kind of uh, biological reaction. Um, uh, can you give me some example where you have done in your laboratory with a, an enzyme? Uh, I showed you just that uh, by bringing uh, fiber optic and uh, infrared laser at one point, I can amplify the other. Just that. 
any other enzymatic uh, reaction uh, other than yes. this uh, yes. like uh, like some uh, glycolysis steps or I something. told you also that by now by not temperature gradient but pressure gradient uh, we can uh, link the RNA world with amino acid. We have not demonstrated, and I think this is the first thing we'll try to demonstrate, is that by oscillating in pressure, we will polymerize nucleotide, which means that we'll be able to make a library of, uh, of uh, RNAs. And once you have a library, then comes selection revolution, Darwinian. But you have to start with something. And uh, my feeling is that the vent could be very useful in that because there are huge jump in pressure. Yes. Uh, yes. The experiments you did in your lab, the convection was generated in cells of particular shapes. You saw the square and the circle. Uh, does it happen like this in nature? The geometry of the cell in which you want convection to happen matters? No, and it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it just example, has to be closed. In, in every pore, you could have convection. It doesn't matter. What matters is, given the size, what is the real number. But uh, we are talking here of a small flow, low flow. For example, to amplify, you don't want the fluid to move fast because you want to copy at low temperature and then bring it to high temperature to melt. So you don't want. And in fact, what I didn't tell you is that in our cell, each time we cycle, because we cycle a little too fast, uh, we copy a small piece, and then it melts. But then it's you copy a little more, a little more. It takes like five cycles to make a real copy, in our case. Sir, under what circumstances and uh, how would have been the first DNA formed? Ah, no idea. <laughs> that's that's a, not DNA, even RNA. Okay, this is the question of the origin of life. Yeah. <laughs> so, where does RNA come from? Crick has a very nice answer. Comes from outer space. Then you wash your hands, <laughs> and some, uh, you know, comes from outer space with some, some of those particles. So, so that's uh, now it looks as if the chemists are becoming very competent in synthesizing RNA. This is in the last four or five years that a real effort is made. And uh, we have to wait and know how can we make RNA. I suspect, again, that cycle and temperature and pressure could be very useful for synthesizing. But you know, this is huge phase space. So we have to find out where, where. But uh, I strongly believe that uh, this generalization of Carnot cycle could lead to a lot of chemical phenomena, which look surprising, but will not be surprising once you do that. So we are one of the few labs where we are working up to 10 kilo atmosphere and, and trying to find out uh, what we can do. Unfortunately, this is a field which is closer to philosophy and not to device which means that the support is low. And the postdoc who work with me uh, knows that they could commit suicide. <laughs> so they have to be passionate. Passionate scientists are rare nowadays. So from time to time, I get a crazy one who wants to accept to work with me on those long-term projects. So it takes time. So uh, yes. how possible is it to synthesize life in the lab? How possible is it to synthesize life in the lab? Oof. 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 <laughs> oh, love. Uh, you, you want, what can I tell you? I can tell you what I believe. I believe this century we'll do it. Not me, but we'll do it. Uh, I find that the more I penetrate in biology, I find the more universal the processes are. And I think uh, if biology gives this impression that it's an impossible thing, it's because of uh, biologists are looking to the exact detail of how things work, which is very important for medical application. Clearly, if I have a disease, I don't want somebody like me to come with philosophical ideas. 
I want a guy who can solve my disease. And for that, you have to be, I mean, absolutely very explicit. But I think that globally speaking, this is another coded system. And this coded system works by chemical reaction. And uh, we'll, we'll do some of that. We'll make it. I, it is this century things to do. What, what, what? I don't hear. Can you do you vary the temperature and pressure gradients in your experiments or? Oh, yes. Or they are kept fixed, the gradient? Well, no, they are fixed. You can put any, you know, once you fix a temperature difference, you have some flow. Uh, and then you can stay there. For example, when we do our PCR, we have to fix temperature difference. When we accumulate DNA, we have to fix temperature difference. But does it matter if you bring it down to zero and then heat now it up we, again? And we could play many other games with, with temperature. So uh, heat is the most disordered form of energy. And it's interesting yes. to see that from that, I think uh, something very ordered came up. Second thing is, I think in the example you gave, you gave the temperatures as 4,000 degrees and 2 degrees. At that level, the Carnot's efficiency is close to 100%, almost 100%, right? So do you need something that efficient to actually generate something like life? You're right. I mean, this is a form of energy. It's not a noble form of energy. But nevertheless, when you have two sources, a hot and a cold one, you can extract energy from it. It's not very efficient. For example, uh, you have seen my plate oscillating. This is, again, the kind of cycle, but the efficiency is rather low. But still, we can extract energy. And this source of energy is very cheap. And also, it's elementary. And because of that, maybe you need this elementary form to start processes. Maybe photon. Uh, more uh, refined source of energy, but then they need more complex molecule to cascade this energy from one electron volt down. And uh, of course, you can make an hypothesis that you know that convection is locally, but there's convection between the surface of the sea and the bottom because you have a gradient of uh, different things. And it could be that it starts there and then be convected and then interact with solar energy. But the source could start here, maybe. Okay. That's an hypothesis. Yeah, is there a threshold in this temperature and pressure gradient which is relevant? And also, is there a window of these parameters? Yes, there is uh, threshold. So what are these kind of ranges? Well, the threshold, there are some thresholds. Uh, for example, in the Rayleigh number, you don't want to be too high. You don't want to be too low. Uh, but there are very reasonable few degrees a few degrees will do it. And in pressure, no. In pressure, you want to get out of water being uh, uh, this anomalous fluid. You see, if you take a protein, you make a protein, you go above 3,000 atmosphere, it opens up. There is no more hydrophobicity. So then you have an, another world. But you have to go to 3,000 atmosphere. You could say 3,000 atmosphere, this is difficult. No, in a small volume, you know, just calculate on one millimeter square, your weight will give you a kilo atmosphere immediately. Yeah. So, uh, do you think, uh, excuse me, uh, do you think at uh, temperatures as high as 3000 degrees Celsius, uh, the base pair uh, specificity would be maintained for DNA replication or any such? I don't know, you know, you have to realize that we are talking about high temperature, but we are talking of a high pressure also. For example, this fluid at 400 degrees, you know, does not boil because you are at high pressure. So you have to rethink all those ideas that you are high temperature, high pressure, deep in the ocean. I don't know if that's a question or it's a question. Uh, they may not understand the question.